Hello, and welcome back to Later Global Cultures. I'm Professor Amy Young, and today I'd like to introduce you to realism and American transcendentalism. You may have noticed that the artistic periods we're covering are getting closer together chronologically, and actually they'll continue to do that throughout the remainder of the class. I think this makes it more fun to try and determine where a particular work or artist might fall on the spectrum, and it's also fun to imagine all of these movements layering on top of each other, making for a multicolored, rich, and complex expression of humanity. You may also notice that the same context can produce very different results in the arts. You may remember some of today's contextual elements from the Romanticism lecture, and now that they've matured a little, we'll see how expression changes with age. But before we begin, I'd like you to consider, how is the real just as beautiful and fascinating as the romantic? The photograph you see here is called Afghan Girl, and it was taken by Steve McCurry. The image is of a 12-year-old girl named Sharbat Gula. She's a refugee in Pakistan, and she had to flee after a Soviet strike killed her parents and left her an orphan. According to McCurry, this portrait sums up the trauma and plight and the whole situation of suddenly having to flee your home and ending up in a refugee camp hundreds of miles away. So this is a very real situation. The image itself is not doctored to make it more emotional. The girl's clothes are tattered. Her face is stoic. She's not weeping or smiling, but somehow we still understand the gravity of her situation. Any emotions this image evokes are of our own creation. McCurry did not compose the photograph to be emotional, yet somehow it still is. Incidentally, this portrait was subsequently used by organizations to create awareness about the situation of refugees worldwide, and even though it was taken in 1984, it remains iconic to the cause. You see, realism, like in this photograph, does not add in drama to get its point across. For realists, real life is dramatic enough. It doesn't need us to color it with sturm and drong. Today in later global cultures, we'll discuss transcendentalism, realism, and photography, and we'll try to understand the historical and philosophical context of realism as we do so. Furthermore, we'll evaluate realism as an expression of 19th century values, as once again, the pendulum has swung, this time away from romanticism. So here, just as in the Romantic era, human expression is impacted by industrialism. The Industrial Revolution is in full swing in both Europe and America, and the factory system has a dark underbelly. In most places, the working conditions are incredibly poor thanks to a lack of labor laws, and this lack also contributes to the exploitation of workers. There are no restrictions on the hours one might be required to work. There's no assurance of safety at work. There is no minimum wage, and there is likewise no minimum age for workers. In many places, children over nine were working nine-hour days. They were, however, required to attend school for two hours a day. Despite these conditions, everyone wants to try their hand at a factory job, especially since other types of work are dwindling. Slums spring up in industrialized cities, and people who need to be close to their factory jobs are pretty much living on top of each other. Locations that were close to rivers and cities became dens of vice and disease as laborers tried to make it on $5 a week. When their wages wouldn't make do, folks turned to prostitution and thievery as these become very real and sometimes easier ways for people to supplement their low wages. In this culture, class divisions are more apparent than ever, and more often than not, those divisions are between those who do the work and those who own the factories, or the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The proletariat are the workers. They don't own any means of production for themselves, and they do not control their own work. So as they have no tools or materials and they can't produce for themselves on a factory scale, they're stuck working for the man. The bourgeoisie are the man. These are the merchants and capitalists who own the means of production, i.e. factories, tools, and materials, and they pay laborers to work and produce. So they aren't doing the actual work, but they're collecting profits from the work that's done. Oh, and in general, they don't do much to improve the lives and conditions of the workers, so you can see where things might get heated. In addition to industrialism and capitalism that's impacting nearly all of the West, there's also the American Civil War here in the States. I'm not going to go into it too far. Um, you're probably already somewhat familiar with it. But you should know a few details. 
The war was between the U.S. federal government and the Confederate states, and all of those anti-slavery, pro-slavery sentiments were set off with the election of Abraham Lincoln. Lincoln's election upsets the South, and the South separates from the rest of the United States. Lincoln vows to protect U.S. assets in the South, and the South attacks some of those assets. As a result, the U.S. was at war. From 1861 to 1865, in just four years, one million people were killed from fighting and disease. Over half of these were soldiers, and the rest were civilian casualties. One-tenth of all northern men were killed, but the South took the hardest hit. Most of the deaths were in Confederate territories, and one-third of all southern men were dead. The South's infrastructure and way of life were destroyed because of these losses, and with the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, four million southern blacks were freed, unchaining the slaves the South relied upon for a bustling trade in agriculture. The 14th Amendment made African Americans equal citizens according to the U.S. Constitution, though, as you probably know, the South was not yet ready to give them equality. Local discrimination laws demanding separate but equal status for blacks were introduced not long after the war, so African Americans were still not part of American society. And all of this resentment and struggle was aided by the economic issues both for blacks and for Southerners throughout the Reconstruction process. And in addition to these historical developments, there were some intellectual developments that shaped the era, too. First, there were the scientific findings of Charles Robert Darwin. Darwin was a naturalist, and he spent a great deal of time studying species and life in South America as he traveled aboard the HMS Beagle. As he traveled, he recorded what he saw in the Brazilian rainforest and Galapagos Islands, territories with rare and often isolated species of wildlife. While there, he noticed some species he'd never seen before, and he also made a special note of how some of these species seemed especially suited to their environments. Darwin theorized that they were bred this way, or more scientifically, that organisms thrive when they propagate the features that are best for whichever environment in which they live. He writes this out in On the Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection or the Preservation of Favored Races in the Struggle for Life. In this work, he describes his ideas about natural selection and survival of the fittest. Those with the best characteristics for survival live and are selected to reproduce so their traits will live on in future generations of the species. It wasn't so far-fetched, actually, as in England they had already been working with a process of artificial selection or selective breeding. Still, his ideas were met with controversy. Can you think of any reason why people might have a problem with this? Well, I mean, if Darwin is right, then nature is no longer the product of divine origin. It's not perfect from the beginning. With this theory, nature becomes a theater for competition, struggle, and adaptation. And this has social implications, too. It leads to theories on social Darwinism. You see, when one applies Darwin's theory to society and politics, one can assert that conflict between groups leads to societal progress, and superior groups will naturally outcompete inferior ones. Does this sound harsh? Could it also be true? Doesn't science have a way, like realism, of not taking our tender sensibilities into consideration? Does it instead present the naked facts for our understanding? Herbert Spencer, a big fan of Darwin and the guy who coined the phrase survival of the fittest, expands on this idea of social Darwinism in social statistics. He writes, For those prematurely carried off must, in the average of cases, be those in whom the power of self-preservation is the least. It unavoidably follows that those left behind to continue the race are those in whom the power of self-preservation is the greatest. They are the select of their generation. So that whether the dangers to existence be the kind produced by excess of fertility or of any other kind, it is clear that by the ceaseless exercise of the faculties needed to contend with them and by the death of all men who fail to contend with them successfully, there is ensured a constant progress towards a higher degree of skill intelligence, and self-regulation, a better coordination of actions, a more complete life. What do you think of this? Do you see these ideas in action anywhere today? Another influential thinker was Karl Marx. He's German, and when he was kicked out of France and Germany, he settled in England. The reason he's important is because, along with Frederick Engels, he determined that social economics are the drivers of history. History. 
The way they saw it, history and societal development were actually more related to economics than they were to great conflicts or great heroes. Think about it. Towns pop up near resources. They're near the shore for ships, and they pop near raw materials for railways. And this had been happening since the dawn of civilization. Think of Egypt and the Nile, or Sumeria and the Fertile Crescent. While this makes sense to us now, it's actually a brand new way of looking at historical development at the time. And Marx and Engels wrote out the details of their theory in the Communist Manifesto. Here's how they describe the system at work in their world, and much of this still rings true today. People in the developed world are dependent on one another because skills are specialized. And since the advancement of means of production, humans are defined by their contributions and what those contributions can get them. The problem is that those who can contribute more to the production machine, meaning they can contribute the machines themselves, are seen as being worth more. This creates classes, and these classes create conflicts. The main classes in conflict were those that I mentioned earlier, the proletariat, or the workers, and the bourgeoisie, or the capitalists. According to Marx and Engels, the new industrial capitalist society was a last stage before a revolution and the end to class conflict. The system of class conflict could not last, and the poor, worker class, would rise up, overthrow the capitalists, and everyone would own production. This would create a universal proletariat, or a perfect society where everyone was working and everyone owned the means to do so. For these guys, the laws of historical economic progression were sort of an economic laws of motion, and they saw this as a scientific reality, not a utopian dream. In their time, they didn't see any chance that the capitalists would improve conditions for workers, and they spoke out against superstructures that denied people their worth. These included religion, political institutions, arts, and philosophies that were the products of the economic structure and thereby products of the upper class's desires. Take a minute. Think about the religion, politics, arts, and philosophy we've discussed thus far. Who's commissioning it? Who's determining its worth? Is any of it being used for profit or propaganda? For these guys, the plight of the working class was systemic. It transcended national boundaries, and the proletariat could only achieve freedom via revolution. In the Communist Manifesto, they wrote that the proletariat have nothing to lose but their chains. In addition to their own acknowledgement of the worth of every contribution, Marx encouraged artistic realism. That is, he encouraged art that was removed from superstructural controls. Marx realized that art has power to influence social and political changes, and likewise, art knows no social class. I mean, we've studied Rococo, so we know that high class doesn't mean great art. Instead, Marx advocated that art should be a reflection of reality, and it too should be a reflection of the lives of all of humanity. In the Communist Manifesto, he and Engels assert that the bourgeoisie, wherever it has got the upper hand, has put an end to all feudal, patriarchal, idyllic relations. It has pitilessly torn asunder the motley feudal ties that bound man to his natural superiors, and it has left remaining no other nexus between man and man than naked self-interest, than callous cash payment. It has drowned the most heavenly ecstasies of religious fervor, of chivalrous enthusiasm, of Philistine sentimentalism, in the icy water of egotistical calculation. It has resolved personal worth into exchange value, and in place of the numberless indefeasible chartered freedoms has set up that single unconscionable freedom, free trade. In one word, for exploitation, Veiled by religious and political illusions, it has substituted naked, shameless, direct, brutal exploitation. Again, what do you think of Marx's points? Do you think that Western society could or can unlearn what has for so long been the norm in favor of a more egalitarian society? So it may not seem like the first conclusion one might jump to as they seem more scientific and sociological than artistic, but these new ways of thinking had an impact on the arts. In fact, literary realism adopted some of these themes and found its expression by rejecting idealized classicism and the exotic themes of romanticism. Instead, realism is based on direct observation of the world, revealing truth via the five senses. So here we'll see less evocation of the sublime and more realistic and or scientific depictions of nature and of people. Furthermore, these are not mysterious as literary realists objectively assess that which one can see, taste, smell, touch, and hear. They're like reporters 
They're not making things up. They're making observations and they're not really assessing emotionally, even if they're hoping the depiction of reality may persuade readers. See, for the realist, real life is art. It is spectacle. They didn't need to give it any extra color or flair. Real life was dramatic enough. Realists examine environments and look for cause and effect, like Darwin did in his scientific observations. That or they address social evils and show how social circumstances beget them, like Marx did in his manifesto. They depict the poorer classes and the struggles of ordinary people as opposed to the emotional struggle of the creator, and they shed light on those things that have heretofore been underexposed. Reality, with all of its grit and unappreciated beauty, was beautiful and worthy of artistic expression. Authors in this era were especially good at depicting their own regional realities, and England and France produced some standouts. You may have heard of Charles Dickens, if you know A Christmas Carol with Ebenezer Scrooge. That's him. So he's still popular today, but Dickens was also popular during his lifetime, and his works were serialized in popular magazines. Dickens writes about Britain at a time when it's both a leading wealthy international power and home to some of the worst poverty, crime, and squalid urban conditions in the West. And Dickens experienced the dirty side of this firsthand. He worked in a boot blacking factory as a child, and he hung with the lower classes. So Dickens' exposure to good people in dire circumstances came out in his novels, and he also pointed out societal villains, too. In fact, Dickens popularized social commentary. He made it en vogue to be frank about social ills, and his serial publications were catchy and comprehensible. In them, he criticizes industrialism, depicting it as a cold machinery that replaced humanity and cared nothing for the real people that got lost in the shuffle. And he does this skillfully. In his novels, the details pile up so that scenes don't just become real, they become overwhelming, like the lives of the people he writes about. One of his more famous works is Oliver Twist. The story exposes social injustice, the evils of industrialization, and it shows the lives and deeds of the poor. The main character is the orphan Oliver Twist, and Oliver's innocence and suffering are relatable and compelling as he's placed in the care of an undertaker, works as a child laborer, and he's exposed to poverty and crime. In the end, the crime in the tale is depicted as a result of society's failing, and the poor look heroic even when they're doing what's legally wrong. France is also down with realism, but theirs is still peppered with a bit of romantic flair, and Gustave Flaubert attempted to depict a real-life villainess in his novel Madame Bovary. See, Parisian society was in an uproar at the time over the illicit affair and death of Delphine Delmar, and Flaubert's novel conveys a contempt for the bourgeoisie as it depicts a woman who is one of them acting like a spoiled brat. This is especially interesting because Flaubert is technically one of the bourgeoisie himself, so his objective insights are an exposure of the delusions of romantic love and romantic fantasy, both for Madame Bovary and for himself. In the story, Emma Bovary cheats on a man who actually loves her because she's looking for a better version of love. She never finds this better version, and while she's emoing away, she lives beyond her means, racking up all sorts of debt, even though she contributes virtually nothing to her life or anyone else's. She craves beauty, wealth, passion, and high society, and her appetites mirror those of romantics and middle-class Parisian society. When her two affairs and accumulated material trappings do not offer her happiness, her dissatisfaction, dismay, and insurmountable debt lead to her suicide. The novel was written in 1856, and at the time it was attacked for obscenity by public prosecutors. All of the controversy, though, only helped to make the story notorious, and the circumstances that led to Emma's demise can be read as both social Darwinism and Marxist justice. Another influential French author is Aurora Dauphine, a.k.a. George Sand. Aurora wrote under a male pen name, but she didn't do much else to hide her identity in society. She married wealthy, divorced, and had many affairs. One of her lovers was Chopin. So in her life and in her writing, she challenged ideas of what female life ought to look like. This is also a strong theme in her novel, Layla. The novel features a woman who is promiscuous but unsatisfied by her sexual exploits. And the story advocates for female sexual liberation and refutes the romantic notion of the eternal feminine. 
In it, Layla suggests that married women like prostitutes were slaves to male desire, and she demands that the same standard of morality for men should be applied to women. So if men can do it, then women can too. Perhaps that pedestal that women were put on was actually a cage. Of course, all of this stunned Victorians with their notions of female purity, and the book pissed off a lot of people too as it questioned the moral validity of monogamy, fidelity, and monastic celibacy. In the novel, Sand writes, Layla had no sympathy for the human race, although she suffered from the same weaknesses. But this blind, deaf race did not want to be aware of its unhappiness and degradation. Some people bid the wounds of their hearts and the exhaustion of their blood beneath a burst of useless poetry. They blushed to see themselves so old, so poor, in the midst of a generation they did not realize was pierced everywhere by old age and poverty. To make themselves look as young as they believed others to be, they lied. They hid the nakedness of their ideas beneath layers of rouge, and they denied their feelings. So yeah, she's advocating not just for realistic depictions of women in the arts, but realistic visions of them in society, too. And visual arts in France also take up the realistic mantle. Like in the literary arts, creators depict scenes featuring working or lower classes. They feature realistic imagery and natural colors, once again revealing truth via the five senses. Plus, they include social commentary to point out those that society is neglecting in their real-life struggles. In realistic visual arts, we see both a revelation of hardship and a celebration of the ordinary. One artist, Jean-Francois Millet, is known for his scenes of peasant farmers that employ these realistic techniques, and others, such as Delacroix, who you may remember from the last context lecture, and Jericho painted social commentary and revealed hardship in their slightly more romantic works. In Raft of the Medusa, Jericho paints the real-life story of a ship, the Medusa, bound for Africa. While en route, this ship hit a reef. The captain and officers saved themselves and left the others to die. Incidentally, the captain was chosen because of noble birth and political connections. 149 passengers and crew members piled onto a raft and remained at sea for days. After bouts with thirst, madness, starvation, mutiny, murder, and cannibalism, only 15 survive. And here, Jericho, in depicting their real plight, is depicting society's horror at the victim's suffering, as well as their anger at the ship's officers. Interestingly, Jericho interviewed the survivors and painted bodies from the morgue to capture realistic representations in this painting. The ship's carpenter was one of the survivors, and here we can see him waving at a ship in the distance, even though it would not come to pick them up. In the end, the event was such a national scandal that the French government tried to cover it up, but Jericho challenges that establishment here in his depiction of humanity against the elements. In his time, conservative members of the press called the painting not fit for moral society. What do you think? Admittedly, this painting is a touch romanticized, but what realistic elements can you identify? What emotions does it evoke for you? As I mentioned earlier, Jean-Francois Millet is noted for his scenes of peasant farmers, and here the gleaners depicts the poor women and children who come through to remove the bits of grain left in the fields after the harvest. There is nothing romanticized about this work. The colors and the figures are realistic and natural, and it's not overtly trying to evoke emotion. Still, a warm golden light suggests something sacred and eternal and were witness to the daily life of these people as they struggled to survive on scraps. Notice how the lines traced over each woman's back lead to the ground and then back up, a repetitive motion identical to their unending backbreaking labor. Not only that, but the curves in their backs mirror the curves in the stacks of harvested grain in the background. Is there anything that feels Darwinist to you here? Anything that feels Marxist? How is this French artist embracing realism and the ideas of his era? And since we're talking about realism and romanticism crossing boundaries, it's probably a good time to talk about the American transcendentalists as they too kind of bridge romanticism and realism, but they do so with an especially American flair. Transcendentalism was an American intellectual movement that developed as a reaction against 18th century rationalism. A few significant individuals were part of this school of thought, but two of the most famous American transcendentalists were Emerson and Thoreau. 
Ralph Waldo Emerson was a Unitarian minister who became dissatisfied with organized religion. He was familiar with romantic poets who reveled in nature, and he too found solace in the natural world, but instead of seeing it as an escape, he saw it as a purer reality. In 1836, Emerson wrote an essay titled Nature, and in it he outlined a oneness with the natural world. He likens the direct experience of nature to a union with God, one that transcended empirical observation. Nature was a place that wasn't corrupted. It was a place where one could experience the divine. There one could understand firsthand the natural order of the universe rather than relying on theories or perceptions of others. And in this work, we can see Emerson's new iteration of that old American optimism and individualism too. He wrote about depending on oneself in his 1841 essay, Self-Reliance. In self-reliance, he states that there is a time in every man's education when he arrives at the conviction that envy is ignorance, that imitation is suicide, that though the wide universe is full of good, no kernel of nourishing corn can come to him but through his own toil bestowed on that plot of ground which is given to him to till. The power which resides in him is new in nature, and none but he knows what that which he can do, nor does he know until he is tried." So, in addition to his admiration for the natural world, Emerson shows his faith in humanity, noting that people are at their best when they are truly self-reliant and independent, and asserting that the only way to be assured of this is for one to experience or know for oneself. Do you see shades of realism in this American philosophy? Henry David Thoreau was a contemporary of Emerson's. He was educated at Harvard, and he resigned his job as a schoolteacher when they insisted that he beat his students. So right there, you already get a sense of Thoreau's rebellious nature. And his rebellion once sent him to prison. See, Thoreau was an abolitionist, and at one point he was jailed for refusing to pay taxes to a government that supported slavery. But on top of all of this, he was also a transcendentalist, and he, like Emerson, saw nature as a place beyond a mess of laws and quote-unquote rationality. He ended up building a cabin on Emerson's property at Walden Pond, and while there, he wrote about his experience of living simply and wisely amid nature. In Walden, he speaks of values similar to Emerson's. He confesses, I went to the woods because I wished to live deliberately, to front only the essential facts of life, and see if I could not learn what it had to teach, and not, when I came to die, discover that I had not lived. And with this true account in Walden, he offers us a touch of realism too. So ultimately, the transcendentalists are complicated. On the one hand, they believed in individuality and self-reliance, and this might come off as a desire to be different, to have a radical identity, to be ego-centered and selfish and break away from society. This seems a bit like a worldview that looks inward rather than outward. And yet, while they realized that society and institutions, particularly organized religion and political parties, corrupted the purity of the individual, they still saw the inherent goodness of both people and nature, and they thought purity was best revitalized when one thought for oneself, without the assistance or interference of society. Things get complicated, however, when you also take a look at the expansive side of transcendentalism. See, they also believed in the connectedness of the universe, and they saw that, via nature, all people are connected to natural surroundings and each other. For them, nature becomes something of a universal soul, something that every individual is connected to, so all of humanity and all of nature is to be respected because it's all a portion of this divinity. Leave it to the Americans to be walking contradictions, right? Realists who support individual effort and optimists who advocate for a connected humanity. And if there's anyone who best embodies this oh-so-American contradiction, it's Walt Whitman. He even tells us so in his poem, Song of Myself. He writes, Do I contradict myself? Very well. Then I contradict myself. I am large. I contain multitudes. Walt Whitman can sometimes be categorized as a transcendentalist, sometimes a romantic, and sometimes a realist. But to me, he is the quintessential American poet. In the preface to his volume of poetry, Leaves of Grass, he wrote, The proof of a poet is that his country absorbs him as affectionately as he has absorbed it. He believed that there was a symbiotic relationship between the poet and society, and he loved, loved, loved America as he traveled and recorded and experienced as much of it as he could in his lifetime. Whitman was born to a working-class family in Brooklyn, so he was familiar with the bustling industrial complex that the city became, and he held a number of jobs there and elsewhere in the nation. 
He worked for a printer. He worked as a teacher. He was a journalist, a nurse, a government clerk. And in each of these jobs, he was able to experience something more of America. His book of poetry, Leaves of Grass, was first published in 1855, and Whitman both designed the volume and paid for the printing. In it, his poetry reaches out to the common person. He's writing about all walks of American life and creating portraits of all the life he sees. His work was realistic. He didn't polish the life he witnessed as he traversed America, but his work is also passionate. He adores the America he sees and is excited about the country's future. Not everyone read it this way at first, though. His work was very controversial, and Leaves of Grass was described as obscene for its overt sexuality. One critic called it a mass of stupid filth, and he claimed that Walt was a pig rooting amongst a rotten garbage of licentious thoughts. Walt was even fired from his job working for the U.S. Department of the Interior, as his boss claimed that he violated the rules of decorum and propriety prescribed by a Christian civilization. But fortunately, Walt was not deterred. The book was only 12 poems when he started in 1855, but he continued expanding and revising Leaves of Grass until his death in 1892, and by then it included more than 400 poems. As it expanded, it included all kinds of America, all nationalities, social classes, genders, ages, and sexual orientations. It included pivotal American turning points as he wrote of Abraham Lincoln's death, the Civil War, and throughout he embraces nature and humanity, seeing the beauty and divinity in all walks of life. Each being is unique like a leaf of grass, and each is united, their interconnected roots and life growing together. His celebration is romantic in its enthusiasm, but its subject is real life, so he's blurring the lines. To make things even more interesting, Walt broke with the standard forms of poetry. He is the father of free verse, discarding the sestet and the sonnet style of early romantics and doing away with the high rhetoric in favor of poetry that was rhythmic and energetic, unconstrained by form or rhyme. Here I've included one of his shorter works, When I Heard the Learned Astronomer. It reads, When I heard the learned astronomer, when the proofs, the figures were ranged in columns before me, when I was shown the charts and the diagrams to add, divide, and measure them, when I, sitting, heard the astronomer where he lectured with much applause in the lecture room, how soon, unaccountable, I became tired and sick, till, rising and gliding out, I wandered off by myself into the mystical, moist night air, and from time to time, looked up in perfect silence at the stars. Notice how he talks trash here about the formal learning environment. See how he contracts long words to make them more down to earth. Look at how the lines are long and tedious, including harsh consonant sounds and cold words in the beginning of the poem, and see how in the second half consonant sounds get softer and the lines get shorter as the speaker finds solace in the simplicity of nature. Seriously, I dare you to repeat those soft M sounds without feeling a little better for the utterance. And that, my friends, is the simple and beautiful way that Walt wanted to see America. I probably shouldn't have included a poem that promoted leaving lectures, but I'm glad I included one that captures the spirit of this great American poet. So, American authors are certainly interesting in their approach to realism, and the visual arts are interesting in their realistic depictions, too. In some areas, there are pretty clear correlations to transcendental philosophy in art, as artists reveal the grandeur of nature and emphasize not only humanity's connection to nature, but also the American sense of optimism and self-reliance that comes with conquering and understanding nature. Elsewhere, they exhibit the realist penchant for scientific accuracy and objective truth. Their works exemplify realist studies of the human figure and a close observation of nature, but their subjects are less politically charged than their European counterparts. Two prominent American artists are Thomas Cole and Thomas Eakins. Thomas Cole was a member of the Hudson River School, a group of American painters whose works glorified nature, and his work definitely exemplifies transcendental philosophy and art. Most of his pieces convey the magnificence of nature and our connection with it, and he embraces all aspects of nature, not just the serene, mystical, or ideal. What we're seeing here is a piece titled View from Mount Holyoke, Northampton, Massachusetts, After a Thunderstorm, the Oxbow. So what do you think? How is this uniquely American? Does it feel both optimistic and threatening? <laughs> 
These are, after all, two sides of nature. And how about that tension between cultivation and the wilderness? The contrast between nature and human presence? Do you see that tiny umbrella tucked away there? There, the artist stands between the two aspects of nature, the rugged, scary part on the left and the sunny, tame part on the right. Indeed, this piece shows humans' connection with nature, and it embodies both the individualistic experiential values of transcendentalism as well as the connectedness and awe of the movement. Thomas Eakins, on the other hand, strove for scientific accuracy and objective truth in works. He painted several hundred portraits, usually of friends, family members, or prominent people in the arts, sciences, medicine, and clergy. Plus, plus he worked as a teacher, so he was a highly influential presence in American art. The work here is called Swimming, and it was painted in 1885. In this work, Eakins gives us individual anatomical studies, and what's more, he's highly skilled at modeling the forms of the body in full sunlight and creating images with realistic depictions of space. Did you notice the natural colors here? The depiction of real life. Eakins offers an unemotional conveyance of American reality, but for sure, it's no less evocative for its lack of drama. And last but not least, there's a new art form on the scene as the development of photography makes photographs an accessible artistic medium. The word photography means to write with light, and in this case, photographers are writing images on photosensitive surfaces. The technology had actually been around for a while, but it kicks into high gear in the 19th century. In England, William Henry Fox Talbot came up with something called photogenic drawing, and with this technique, he fixed negative images on paper coated with light-sensitive chemicals. And in France, Louis Daguerre exposed a positive image onto metal coated with light-sensitive chemicals and invented the daguerreotype. In photography, technological developments were fast and furious, and in just a few years they went from 40-minute exposure times to 60 seconds, making photography more accessible. The ease and availability of photographs led to photos for all classes. Presidents got pictures, as did every other Joe Schmo, and some photographs were even mass-produced. There were 100,000 daguerreotypes sold in Paris in 1849 alone. Photos were also useful for the media, and they were used to preserve an historical record, too. You can imagine why reporters and historians were interested. For the first time, they have real, not idealized records of historical events. And one of the most photographed events was the Civil War. Before this time, artists depicted wars. And photographs from the Civil War changed the image of war from one that was heroic to one that was devastating, as photographers allowed common people to really bring the battle home. Can you imagine how those first viewers must have felt? Do you think those sorts of images had a greater impact on them than they'd have on us today? So yes, perhaps especially with photography, reality finds a way to persuade and make the stuff of real life dramatically impactful. Alexander Gardner was one prominent Civil War photographer, and his home of a rebel sharpshooter captures some of the real-life horrors of the conflict. As I mentioned before, artists had depicted the war, and here, even without color, we have a realistic, unadorned, and real-time image that leaves no room for romantic ideas. Now, Gardner may have moved the body and added the gun as a prop, but even if he did, he still drives home the notion that this was a mechanized war fought from great distances. He shows us that people, real people, were dying, and this reality hit home for civilians. See, folks at home had no idea what it was like in the field. There were even stories about people trying to set up picnics to watch battles. This is how out of touch with the real dangers they were. But this era begins a long history of gory war photography meant to bring the battle home. Gardner himself said that such a picture conveys a useful moral. It shows the blank horror and reality of war in opposition to the pageantry. Here are the dreadful details. Let them aid in preventing another such calamity from falling upon the nation. And now you've had a healthy dose of realism. I hope that you've seen how it's released some of the forced emotion of romanticism in favor of an authentic and no less emotional depiction of real life. Until next time.